let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for bringing us all back here for another week of rest. Lord, we also thank you that we can celebrate Women Emphasis Day today and to actually know our place in your plan. Lord, help us to be blessed by the worship today so that we can also reconsider our position, our role and our function in this world to come and enduring pandemic. All this I ask in precious Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is in John 4, verse 29. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? May the Lord be with us. 
as we hear the message today. Hi, uh, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath and happy Women's San Francisco Day. Today my topic is actually come and see. It's actually prepared by um, our division. But I just want to add something to it. And one is what um, the saviour of the world is the, the quenchable person. The person that can quench everything that we are struggling with. Right? And I think a picture paints a thousand words. Now, you know, in this picture, what do you see? Most of us see a barren land. Most of us see a water pot. Most of us see the well. And most of us see the, the brown, brown stuff. There's no greenery. And many times when we see this picture, we wonder, where is God? How can we live or survive in such a place? And, and we ask ourselves, are we supposed to serve God like that? And yet, the Egyptian uh, people in Egypt, in Exodus, they were sent to this place 40 years to wonder about it. And is this place a barren place? Is this place a place that we find our God? Or is this place a place that we find ourselves? Or is this place a place that we finally see who we are and we finally see who God is? I mean, can you imagine just a picture? There's so many, many questions to ask. Who is the well? What is the water pot? What is the barrenness of it all? Is there a mirage I see? And can God quench all this barrenness, thirsting, and hunger of our soul? It's so far cry from Singapore. And today, I'm going to bring a sermon here to the women and to our church about Singapore. How do you come and see the saviour of the world in Singapore? How do we not need? And what do we need instead? So it actually is very different from how we see things and how God sees things. We had a wonderful um, Sabbath school this morning with Pastor Samuel Mani. And he reminds us that, you know, how God sees us and how man sees us is very different. You know, um, Probably when we see ourselves and we see our friends, we will say, yeah, you know, this one, you know, good, no good, no good, no good, you know. But God doesn't see us that way. He actually sees our heart. Now, you know, um, the story of Andrew, Project Andrew, um, he just invited Peter and said, come and see. And Peter said, see what, right? And Philip, he did the same to Philip. Philip, you want to know my saviour of the world? Come and see. That's all he, he, he invited them. Come and see Jesus. You know, how to see Jesus? And that was a very powerful invitation because many of us say, you know, we have to do this, 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 before we invite people to come and see Jesus. But Andrew's method was very simple. Come and see. I am who I am. Just come and see. And here we see at 12 noon a woman, a Samaritan, um, someone who was hiding at 12 midnight. You know, usually um, Dracula or if you are a criminal, you'll come out at night, midnight, so that nobody can see you. And this lady, a Samaritan woman, came out where everybody is not there. And it was 12 noon because it's very, very hot. And she don't have to go and get the water. 
by being chastised or looked down upon by the people that watch her go get the water. She was first of all a woman. She was first of all a Samaritan. They call her probably a hybrid uh, DNA. And a low down woman who has, well, not married. Wonder where the husband is. And she knew that she was condemned. So she had to go at 12 noon, where it's very hot, to get water. And just as she went to this well, she found a man. And the man just asked her one thing, give me something to drink. She shocked her. That was the turning point in her life. She asked Jesus, uh, I beg your pardon, are you, are, you, are you inviting me to give you a drink? Do you know who I am? Do you know how lowly I am? Do you know I'm a Samaritan? Do, do you know my background? No one would talk to me, even ask me for a drink. And, and, and there's something in this person's voice that made her curious to want to engage in the dialogue with Jesus. She just cannot understand why would he reach out to him? Why wouldn't the disciples around him ask Jesus, don't talk to her, don't talk to her, she's just a low down, she's a woman. You know, in the, pre in the past, men are not supposed to talk to women, right? And women, uh, in, even in our Chinese culture right now, uh, some, some Chinese family believe that um, sons are more important than daughters, right? Because sons carry on the name. Uh, women are just married off and take on their husband's name and they are not supposed to belong to our family. So there is this, this kind of discrimination against gender, culturally. And yet this man say, yeah, just give me a drink. You just don't know what I'm asking you. Because if you know who I am, I will give you a drink that is, you know, it will quench your thirst. And I think in some translation, it calls it a perpetual spring of water. You will never thirst again. And she was very, very shocked. You know the story of the woman at the well? I think a lot of us know the story. It's so familiar. Ah, you know, why say it again? But today we want to look at the women at the well from a different point of view, from we can go or I can go, or I will go, or I shall go. Are we sure? The, the story tells us about good news about Jesus. You know, there are three points we, that we don't need, which in Singapore, we need. And many of us in pandemic, especially the second lockdown, um, there was a survey done by, by um, some survey organization about isolation during pandemic. And during pandemic, the second lockdown, I actually received more calls for help, not among uh, the baby boomers, uh, which are in their 60s and 70s, not so much from baby busters, which is the Generation X. Because we used to live in a, a country where there was no technology, no TV, and our life was actually very slow in the kampong time. So when we were locked down, all of us just slow down and then go back to our kampong days. But for Generation Y, millennial generation, we received more calls for help, for self-harming. Because in their homes, either the marriage of the family members like their parents are not intact, communications are not loving, not kind, siblings are rivalry because of favoritism, and in isolation, home-based learning cannot go out. They have to face the family intensity of chaos, and it's so painful for some of them while they are looking for their identity. They, their family sometimes are in chaos. They can't find a job. The job is um, underemployed, and some of them even have like, I can't find my partner. 
and this way of just starting life, studying so hard, and just reaching pandemic and like, oh, you know, like all domains are helpless. They feel the pain. Some of them tells me that, you know what, I'm going to be lonely forever. I don't know where is my partner, where is my job, and I'm not good enough. And I feel by cutting myself, at least I feel less pain. It's very sad to hear the younger generation tells you of their pain and suffering behind closed doors. You know, they are looking for real relationships with parents, with children, with their bosses, with their peers, even with a good partner. You know, many of us, we want to reach our world, but many of us have not even reached our inner world. The Samaritan woman wasn't perfect. She knew there was something missing in her heart. She was crying, not for the real water. Can you really see it? She was crying for the thirst of her soul. Can Jesus quench it? Can this man quench this thirsting of the soul that I'm good enough? I'm good enough to share my story, to share my story of pain that in my shame, shameless life, can I do something for God? You know, and, and, and it sparked a curiosity in her. You mean I don't need to be perfect? Instead of an imperfect life, are we giving an excuse? To, are we saying, you know what? You know, in our Sabbath school, we were reminded that, you know, God sees us not as, just as we are, but Jesus' blood covers us. And God sees the potential of us. When we see our friends, when we see our church members, what do you see? Do you just see a church member that can't make it, you know, can't make it? And that's what my parents tell me. You can't make it. Because they only see the flaw. And this man can see me, tells me what I have, I, all I did. You know, he said, go get your husband. She said, I don't have one. And she said, no, you, you answer rightly. You have actually four or five of them, but not anyone is your husband. And she, instead of being ashamed, it took an opposite turn. Are we comfortable with our vulnerability? Are we comfortable with our shame? Are we comfortable that Jesus can quench it? We don't need to be perfect. You know, one of my colleagues uh, showed a very, very moving testimonial of someone in Singapore. It was a couple. I'll cut the whole story short, but I will send you all the YouTube on WhatsApp group. It's half an hour each of their story. It's a lady. Her name is Judy Halim. Um, she came from Indonesia. A rich man fell in love with her and brought her to Indonesia. They brought her to Singapore. And she, they got married, like a fairy tale marriage. And what happened was, in six months' time, she was pregnant, and the child came out was. Uh, had William disease and special needs. And after some time, the first husband actually divorced her because he had infidelity. She didn't know how to speak English. She was in Singapore. She had a special needs child. She haven't found a job. And in the end, she walked into a church. And for the first time in church, she didn't even understand what was spoken in church because it was all in English. But there was something in that service that made her feel at peace. And when she walked out of the church, she just saw everything differently. She did not solve her problem yet, but she believed. So she started her spiritual life. She dedicated her, her life to God. And she decided that since she has no money, she might as well just not take her daughter to the doctor. And so she did not. When the child was six years old, she finally Work through a security, work as a security guard, land up being an operator, land up um, 
became a HR manager and Lena being a director. And you know what happened when she became a director in HR? Her English was no good. Her boss sent her for English class. Every morning or every week, she has to write a memo to the whole entire staff. And you know what the staff does in Singapore, you know? They're very cruel. They will take a red pen, go to the memo where everybody is walking past. They will circle it and say, this, this one English grammar no good. This one English grammar no good. And then they will draw a turtle. And she almost gave up. Here she is struggling to live, trying struggling to live with a special needs child. And there was this all torment about her English. And finally, she, she prayed. And God told her, don't give up. Go bring your, do your daughter to see the doctor. She brought the, do the daughter to see the doctor. And the doctor was shocked. The doctor asked her, what do you do to your daughter? She said, nothing. I just love her and just look after her because I have no money. At two years old, she had three holes in her heart. At six years old, when they go to see the doctor, the holes are not there. The doctor said, there's no way, no way. You know what? God healed the daughter's heart. But she was having Down syndrome, so she thinks that she will pray. The amount of belief, the level of conviction, the amount of confidence you have in God, determine your faith. And you know she made a blunder. She sent her daughter to a normal stream school because she thinks since God is so powerful, can heal the heart, will heal the brain. You know? Sometimes we are presumptuous. And after some time, she realized she was wrong. She asked God in prayer. And God said, when I give you this daughter, do you think it's against you or it's for you? She repented. She went to the daughter. She pulled her out from the normal scream school and she put her in a special needs school and she apologized to the daughter. She said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I'm such a mother. Please forgive me. And when the daughter was put in the special needs school, the daughter, when the mom apologized to the daughter, the daughter knew she was Down syndrome. She knew the mother did not accept her for who she is. And when she was put in the special needs school, she started playing the piano. And long cut the long story short, she met a man, she remarried the man and her started a, a restaurant. They became a self-supporting minist uh, ministry for the 600 over orphans around Southeast Asia. And not only that, the husband encountered cancer, only the 50 rare case, and she was, he was supposed to die. Can you imagine this woman, a special needs child, a foreigner in Singapore, cannot speak English very well, Husband, second hus first husband had uh, infidelity, second husband dying of cancer. But yet, the husband and her say, the more we go out and do God's work, because they prioritize God. Do we need to know everything? No. The Samaritan woman did not know everything about religion. She just met Jesus has questions about the Bible, about worshipping God. And Jesus told her that I am the person you are waiting for. And I will explain everything to you. But the fact that he was able to tell her everything that she did was good enough for, for her. She ran, she ran, she ran. Did she run away from Jesus? Did she run away from her problem? No. She ran to freedom. I don't need to know everything about Jesus. We only need to know Jesus daily. Come see this man. This man that could be Christ. To reach our world, we don't need to know everything. We just need to know what Jesus did for us today. And we can share that. It's daily manner. We don't need to go very far. She ran back home, and she just went back to her, her home and tell all her friends, hey, you know what? But before she ran back, before we ran, run out and tell people about Jesus, she did one thing that we probably forgot. She left her water pot 
at the well. She forgot that her original mission was to go and get water. You know, Jesus is so exciting where you, 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 you can feel his presence. You can feel that he comes into your life so real. Many, many young people ask me, Auntie Carol, how to make Jesus real in my life? I don't want it to come from my parents. I don't want it to come from my pastors. I don't want to come from my church members. I mean, it's okay that they share their stories, but I want to see Jesus for myself. I want to hear Jesus for myself. I want to feel Jesus for myself. Give me time. Give me space. I want to have that authentic relationship with Jesus. As she left her water jar, I want to challenge each and every woman and all of us in church. What does it take for you to know Jesus and leave your original so-called aspiration, your own way, your own thoughts? What does the water pot stand for? Is it your career? Is it your marriage? Is it your studies? Is it the five C's? Or is it something great? Or is it the pride of life? Is it the lust of the eye? Or is it the lust of the flesh? What does your water pot, each and every one of you, you ask yourself, you be very honest with yourself, what is your water pot? She forgot about her water pot. She ran away not in fear. She did not run away in depression, did not run away in anxiety. She ran away in freedom. She ran to her home. She ran to her neighbor with freedom. Hey, come, come, come. I found something. I found something. Come and see for yourself. Come and see for yourself. She don't have to know everything. She's not perfect. She don't need to go very far. To reach our world, it's actually just near our sphere of influence, our circle, our family, our friends, our space. Because the people who saw her got so excited, who always tried to hide from them, to go to the well at 12 noon, suddenly wasn't ashamed of herself anymore. Her vulnerability, her transformation of just her own life, at that moment was good enough for many people that get curious and say, okay, we will go and see. So the Bible say, the, people, the villagers went out to see. And they told her, we, you don't have to say more, we will see for ourselves. You know, we learned that we can go reach our world. We do not need to be perfect. Do not need to know everything. We do not need to go far because Jesus can quench our thirst our hunger, and even our worldly passions. The Samaritan story shows us that we can actually make a difference. How we invite others to come and see the Saviour. We need to prioritise. This is what we don't need. We don't need to be perfect. We don't need to know everything. We don't need to go very far. But that doesn't mean the more you know is bad. But you know what? How are we going? There are three things we need to do. So we already know three things we don't need. And now we are three things that we need. Number one, prioritize. Judith Harlem, even if the husband was dying, the daughter is a, a special child, they still put God first. Their work, their business, they still put God first. The husband said, even if I die, let's go to the mountain and bless more orphans. If I die, I die. If I'm in pain every day, I thank God. If I die, hallelujah. If I heal, hallelujah. Do we have that kind of spirit? Do we trust God so much that, you know, come what may, I will still be blessed because God knows better than me. And, and you, their priorities so strong, you know. They leave their water pots behind because they know who owns the well. Who owns the desert? Who transformed the desert? That's how much they know. We need to share our story. 
and we need to focus on Jesus. We need to tell our story, how our life has been changed by God, how, why God led us through the desert experience. Because then we can tell others and share with others the power and the secret power of God's strength and His life, how He changed us in our weakness. My friends, do you believe my grace is sufficient for you? And all of us have a thorn in our flesh. Will you let God? I asked my father that day, two days ago. He asked me, can you do me a favor? I was like, yeah, okay, what? He said, can you just go look after the weaker family members? I was like, Dad, can't you see I'm also weak? He can't see me, you know. He can't hear me. All my life, I told him I have to do everything with my bare hands and with God's help. And you ask me, go look after the weaker people. I asked him, can you stop being a Santa Claus? Can you just look after yourself? I cried very badly that night. I asked God, why? Why me? Isn't that enough? I spent 3,000 hours trying to help so many people in my life, in my work, and I have to take up the burden of the family. And my father's last wish is, go take care of the weaker people. And then here I am, I tell him, I'm also weak, but he can't see it. And I cry, I say, you know, where is my father? My father is supposed to protect me, supposed to love me. I, when I cry, I have, I think God was so good to me this week. I was very, very sad. Even though I was at the peak of my personal potential career life, anything you name it, I have it. I don't lack anything. But yet this week, I was very down. And I asked, I asked God, why? And you know, it's so interesting. God never let me go. Monday, I had to do a Bible study with someone who was going through a cancer treatment. And I felt ashamed. Here I am, able body. I don't know who was the weaker party. I think I'm the one with the able body. And here I am giving Bible study. I ask God, you know, I'm really complacent, right? And it changed me Monday. Tuesday, we had a how to pray, how to do prayer journal. Instead of dear God, da 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 da, a shopping list or whatever, it was so exciting. It was a young child, a young teen, that wrote a journal that said, Dear child, from his Bible study, these are the impression from God. It was so interesting. It was a role reversal. And I was telling myself, Yeah, why did I never write a letter to myself from God? That changed my life. Monday, working with the week, Tuesday, sent to a prayer meeting and got my life turned turn upside down. Wednesday, we had prayer meeting. Wednesday, I talked to my supervisor and told my supervisor at what state I was in. And he asked me, you know what? Uh, what other reinforcement do you need? The, the organization is going to send you all the reinforcement. You just need to say it and we will do it. Okay. Okay. I got it. I got it. I asked God, okay, I got it. I, I underestimated how powerful God was. And Thursday, I had friends. Thursday, my father asked me, can you step up, honour my family this way? I was very tired. I was not tired doing everything that I'm doing. I was tired emotionally. But I also know one thing. In my weakness, his grace is sufficient for me and he's not going to leave me alone to do anything he asked me to do. And I felt guilty, I felt ashamed. 
And then he sent a butterfly. Wednesday, a butterfly came into my home while I'm working. Fly, 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 flutter, flutter, flutter. Very beautiful butterfly, and I went off. Thursday, he sent another butterfly. Same butterfly. Happily flying, 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 flying. God knows what we need. We need to prioritize because you help us carry the burden. We need to um, know what is important. Leave your water jar behind. Share your testimony as, as we are. Yeah. Because God sees differently. And when you are evangelized, you become the evangelist. We no longer believe because of what you say now we have heard for ourselves and for what we know. It's a personal encounter with Jesus. I just had the most incredible personal experience. And we just need to focus on Jesus. What did Jesus do for us? Now, the Saviour appeared as the most effective missionary. And when we love God, we see the love of God, we will want to bring further messages to people. And you know what? We become the receiver and become a giver at the same time. We are called to reach our world. And today, this morning, there is this uh, Revival and Reformation devotion. It says that God may choose and feed anybody. He doesn't need uh, the rich, the clever, the resourceful. He only needs us to understand and know that He is God. He is the person who judges. He is the person who gives us the righteousness. He is the person who is loving and kindness. And He has the Holy Spirit to actually uh, give us all the inner resourcing. And he, we will receive power to do God's work. We will, only if we are willing to be used. And he will also send us people that is beyond our expectation. We think this person will not be able to minister to us. But yet, it is this person that is sent to you. The very person that you thought they are weak. And you should have somebody else, but actually it's not. As I minister to people around me, I feel that God used all of them to actually satisfy my inner hunger and thirst deeper into myself. I challenge all of you, we will one day be butterfly, but we can be caterpillar at the same time, eating and eating and eating and drinking from the well and fountain of life. And that is Jesus. And that will give us the power, the secret power and energy to go reach our world. I want you all to, like, when you leave this assembly today, I want you to put in your heart, come see a man who told me everything I did and introduce to your friends this wonderful opportunity that you have experienced. Let us now uh, stand and pray that God give us the opportunity and courage to respond. Here am I. Send me. I will go reach my world. Thank you. Dear God, forgive us our, our hesitancy, our reservation, our holding back, because you actually have far greater plans than what our mind can conceive. Lord, I know that um, you love us all, and, and every case will not, you will not come until every case in our church is determined whether we are fit to go back home. You love us so much that you will hold back yourself from coming. Lord, just stir in our hearts that I will go where you want me to go. I will say what you want me to say. And I'll, I'll do what you want me to do. Lord, I really thank you for all my experiences in life, even today, even just the past week, because we serve a living God. Every day you are real. And I pray for our church, our whole entire body of Christ, to experience a personal, real experience every day of our life. 
so that we can go out and share the last day message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.